This year has taught us so much. It showed how quickly everything we know can change. It showed us how strong we are, and yet how much we need each other. And as life continues to resume to what it once was, it can be easy to take all we have and all we learned for granted. Yet there are thousands of children, young adults and families affected by the foster care system in Georgia who don't know what a stable home feels like. For nearly 150 years, Wellroot Family Services, formerly called the United Methodist Children's Home, has nurtured the feeling of home for Georgia's most vulnerable children, teens, young adults, and families. When you give to Wellroot, 100% of your gift provides children and families the power to realize their God-given potential. Give a gift that nourishes the soul and helps create a safe, loving home. After all, home is where we belong. And now, more than ever, home matters. Well, good morning. I'm Reverend Jim Bugman, Senior Pastor here at Buford First United Methodist Church, and welcome to Bless Buford Live, our online worship service. We're glad that you decided to join us this morning, and of course, we'd love to know that you are worshiping with us. So mention it in the comment section of whatever format you're on, and let us know who you are and where you're worshiping with us from. And also, if you have a prayer concern, you can mention it there. If you are on our online.church platform, you would see a live prayer button. You can click that and one of our hosts will come and join you and you can share the prayer concern with them. If it's a confidential request, just mention it and it will pass directly to me and only me. You could also text us your prayer concern. If it's a confidential one here, again, just mention it in your text, but simply text the word prayer to 770 770- 343-7143. And that will start a dialogue where you can mention your prayer concern. But know that we are praying for you this week. Well, today is a special Sunday for a couple reasons. You notice that before the welcome, there's a video from the Methodist Children's Home. Well Root is their name now. And, and this is so we're today we're collecting a special offering for the Methodist Children's Home. This is one of the most vital ministries that we have in our North Georgia Conference. It's, it's so vital in which we're placing children in homes where they are loved, uh, whether with foster parents, and some do lead to adoptions. But it may just be for a short period of time as, as we strive to get families reunited with one another. So, so Well Root Family Ministries are constantly providing programs and ministries to help families if all possible, to come back together, while at the same time placing children in a safe environment. So let me encourage you to give toward this special offering today. If you have not done so, then you can do it by sending it in to the church this week, or you can also give online. Uh, If you go through bill pay, just designate it in the notes section. Say this is for Well Root or the Methodist Children's Home. Or if you go to our website, there'll be a place where you can click for the Methodist Children's Home Offering. Your gift does make a difference in the life of our church. Well, today is also a Sunday in which we get to recognize some of our senior adults. We were kind of deciding what to call them, so we've kind of gone with the Golden Seniors. You know, these are our seniors who are 85 years old and older. And after the welcome, you will notice a a list kind of scrolling through with their names. And we're going to honor them in this way. Typically on this Sunday, we have a banquet in which we invite them to, but but we can't do that this year, can we? But our older adult committee, they're going to be taking out some goodies to them this afternoon. Uh, So be in prayer for these golden seniors. If you see the names, if you want to send them a note, just let them know that you're thinking about them, praying for them. You can do that. If you need an address, contact the church office and we'll be glad to give you their address. Now, as we begin our worship together, let's pray, fall into prayer. You'll see the list of the names and then we'll begin our worship. 
But let me pray for us this morning. Well, say, Heavenly Father, we come to you to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you. Accept the worship that we have to offer to you today. And Father, right this moment, we want to lift up these seniors whose names will be shown, who are thinking about in our hearts and in our prayers. Be with them. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their influence, as they have influenced many of us in this community. So thank you for them being their ambassadors of your love and of your grace. Help us to learn that from them. So be with them today. Offer them the peace that you can offer and let them know that you are present with them. Now, Father, we come to worship you. Accept the worship that we have to offer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's worship together.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What up, my peeps? Welcome to the Children's Moment. I'm Miss Susan, and I'm so glad that you guys are joining me today. I've got some really exciting things to share with you, and I can't wait to hear what you guys thought about the Bible story last week and the story for this week. So let's do a quick review. Our first Bible story was about what? Do you remember? The light and the dark, right? And how God created the day and the night. And then he sat back and he thought, this is good. And so the next thing he created was living things. He created all the animals in the world. Now I want you to stop and think for a minute. How many animals can you think of right off the top of your head? Cat, dog, tree, lizard, frog, snake, bee, butterfly. It goes on and on, doesn't it? There are lots and lots and lots of animals that God made. God is so creative and he created so many beautiful animals. In our Bible story this week, we discuss how God made all the different animals, the ones that lived in the sea, the ones that lived in the air, the ones that walked on the ground, the ones that that crawled, the ones that slithered, the ones that swim. He made them all. Just imagine how awesome that is that he can make all those different things. And what about our animals? Do you have a pet? We have five. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. We have three dogs and two cats. That's a lot of uh, pets in our house. But I love our pets so much. And I bet you guys have pets that you love too, right? And it just makes you feel so good when they snuggle up to you and they put their little heads on your shoulders because it just makes you feel good. Well, that's the kind of feeling that God wants us to share with other people through our love with animals and through our love for others and just sharing his love with everybody. So that's what he wants you guys to remember about this week is that he created all the beautiful, amazing animals. And how can you um, take what you know about the animals and turn it into a way to share God's love? I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about that. Now, next week, we are going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about the third day. And on the third day, God created, hmm, I wonder what. You guys will have to check it out next week and see, okay? I hope you have a most amazing week. And if you didn't get a chance to check out the Bible story, go to viewforfirstumc.org and now you can watch the Bible story there. I hope you guys have a truly blessed Sunday. Jesus loves you and Miss Susan does too. Bye. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Bless Buford Live. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. My name is Justin. I am the Director of Modern Worship at Buford First UMC. And I just want to know, um, just comment, uh, did you wake up at any point this week and go, man, it feels good outside? Because I did. It was awesome. I am just so thankful um, that the humidity seems to be dropping, and um, that makes the Holy Spirit rise in me. So <laughs> I hope that everybody is having a great morning. Excited to worship with you guys today. And I just want to invite you, just take this opportunity to just close your eyes, settle your spirit, open your heart, and just prepare your hearts for worship. And just let's thank the Lord for today and that he is in in control of everything. Amen. So let's worship together. Let the king of my heart 
week we started a new series called Frenzied Families. And uh, of course, during this time, it's it's easy to see why families could be kind of living on the verge of uh, frenziness, so to speak. You know, but we can't just blame it on the pandemic. We can't blame it on the frustrations with the school or the church, whether we're open or whether we're not. We, we cannot blame it on a dysfunctional government that seems to be more interested in fighting than help us to move through this situation. If we're honest, then part of it is we have to look at ourselves. You know, we have to ask ourselves, how are we reacting to what is going on around us? Do we, do we give in to fear uh, or do we rebel and become completely, uh, let's say, self-centered and say, this is what I want? You know, are we, are we a little cross sometimes or are, are we able to be patient with people? See, the way we react determines a lot. The way we react has an influence on others around us. Because like it or not, we do influence people around us. For those of us who are parents, you know, you you have influence on your kids. And, you know, that can be a little scary at times when we start looking at our, our behavior. You know, in fact, if you go back to Scripture and look in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way we sh- he should go, so even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, and we want to cling to that as a promise uh, that, that we think that if we do everything right, that if we respond in the right way, then our kids are going to be okay too. 
Well, some of you know that that's not always the case. You know, and that's the kind of a terrible truth that, uh, well, that's the other side of it, right? If we fail, if we mess up, are we going to be affecting our kids? Are we going to be affecting those around us? And one of the problems with looking at things like Proverbs, Proverbs are those sayings that a lot of times do have truth in them, but they may not always be the truth. You know, we, we take heed. It's, it's worth paying attention to what they say. But yet, at the same time, we have to be careful by reading too much into it. A lot of us are used to the saying, an apple does not far, fall far from the tree. And there's a lot of truth. That's a proverb. There's a lot of truth in that. But a lot of times it's how we deal with the pressure that comes upon us that determines how we can also influence others. And, and so today we're going to be taking a look at an instance in the Old Testament in which, in which one of the kings had to make a decision. Is he going to continue with the influence of his father, his grandfather, his, his grandmother, or is he going to can take on responsibility for himself and then become an influencer for others. So if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 through 15 is what we're going to be reading. 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 through 15. Now in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem 41 years. His grandmother's name was Machah, daughter of Apislon. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even disposed his grandmother, Machah, from her position as queen mother, because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asira. Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and articles that he and his father had dedicated. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So let me kind of give you a background a little bit of what was going on. Israel was, was kind of going through their own civil war, so to speak. You had Israel up in the north and you had Judah in the south. And so this civil war kind of took place really just a couple kings, a couple kings after King David. And those of you who know scripture knows that King David was the king of Israel. In fact, the promised Messiah was prophesied to come from the line of King David, and, and Jesus Christ did so. So we had David, then Solomon, then Rehoboam, right? Father to son, father to son. And during the reign of Rehoboam, that's when the split occurred between Israel and Judah. And both kingdoms had something very much in common that then their kings that they had, nearly all of them, turned away from God. In fact, in the northern kingdom of Israel, all their kings, all 19 of them, what Scripture says, except for one, turned away from God, and that one was Jehu, and he kind of was a mixed bag, so to speak. Well, the southern kingdom did a little bit better. Eight out of the 20 did what was right in the eyes of God. That means the other 12 kind of kept rebelling. So here's some things that we can learn. Well, one of the things that we can learn is that leaders do influence. You know, our government officials do influence. That's without a doubt. Uh, so we need to hold them to a high standard of how they behave. We need to hold them to a high standard of morality. And for us who are followers of Christ, when we kind of relate it to our situation, we want to be sure, are they looking at a moral absolute or are they just kind of going along with what everybody else wants? 
But we also have to realize this, that our leaders at some times, they're going to fail us. All our government officials are. And that's not an excuse for us, for our moral failures. It's not an excuse for us turning our eyes off of our God. And there's something else I think that can be seen in, in some of their history. And that's, that's what we see most of the kings is that the son who inherited the kingdom usually got what he had from his father. So it passed down from father to son, father to son. There was this influence of the families that passed down. Now that's not always the case. And that's what we're looking at today. I saw was an exception. He wanted to do right in the eyes of, of the Lord. That's what the scripture said. But in order for him to do right, he had to break this, this cycle of family dysfunction, this cycle of turning away from God. In fact, he even had to, to let go of his grandmother from her position of queen mother. That took some challenge and that took some, some leadership to be able to do that. So you got Asa, who was the king, right? His great grandfather, who was Solomon. And Solomon had introduced a lot of the pagan worship that was going on. And then you had a, a grandfather, Rehoboam, who divided the kingdom. And a father who always was at constant war with his neighbors. A grandmother who was powerful and this persistent queen and a, a, introducing all these other pagan worships. And then here was Asa. Uh, some of us can identify with him, you know, because we have a dysfunctional past. We, you know, nobody has a perfect family. Some families are more interesting than others, aren't they? But all of our histories have some rough spots. And, but here's the good news. The good news is that, that we believe as followers of Christ, we believe that our past does not have to dictate our present nor our future. We have a God who is in the business of transforming lives, of transforming hearts. You know, and, and that we've seen it personally. I've seen it happen in families throughout where that cycle of dysfunction was broken because of a transformed life. And so our prayer is that our transformed lives, our transformed hearts will be what influences others around us, influence our kids, influence our co-workers, influence our communities. Even when we are right in the eyes of the Lord, it does not necessarily mean that our children and others will be. That's, that's the tough part. You know, because we have, we each have to make our own decision to follow Jesus Christ. We each have to make that decision, what we're going to do with Christ. And that's the decision that we make each and every day, each and every moment of the day. Because just as we receive God's grace, we can also turn around and leave that grace. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ is always there waiting and willing to transform us, just as he's willing to transform others around. One of the most helpful books in the years past was written by a Rabbi Harold Kushner, and it's called when, when Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it really came about as a transforming moment in him and his wife's lives. Uh, you know, like most people, this is what he wrote. Let me just read it to you. He says, like most people, my wife and I had grown up with an image of God as an all-wise, all-powerful parent figure who would treat us as our earthly parents did, or even better. If we were obedient and deserving, He would reward us. If we got out of line, He would discipline us, reluctantly but firmly. God would see that we got what we deserve in life. So they tried to live their lives a way that, that, that they knew would be pleasing to God. And they thought they would be rewarded. But then their son was diagnosed with a, a dreaded disease that he eventually died from. And, and their faith was really strained, as, as you can imagine. 
And they kept saying to themselves, this can't be happening. This is not how the world is supposed to be. And, and it caused them to think through this theology of sin and suffering and punishment. I get that. Because, you know, as parents, as people, we, we want to think that if we live our lives the way that we're supposed to live it, then hopefully that will pass on to our children and to others. But there are times that we see that does not happen. One day, as Jesus and his disciples were walking along, uh, they kind of saw a pitiful sight. They saw this blind man who was who was begging for help. And, and the disciples, when, when they saw this blind man, they asked Jesus, it says, who has sinned, this man or his parents? Because see, that was the belief that if something was wrong with someone, then either they did something wrong or their parents did something wrong. That's kind of what we think a lot of times. But Jesus looked at him and, and says, you know what? He says, says, neither him nor his parents sinned. They, they did not do anything wrong. But what has happened to this man is so that the works of God can, might be shown, that they might be demonstrated. To me, that is something so important for us to remember because there's going to be times we look around and we say, did I do something wrong? Was my influence a bad influence instead of a good influence? You know, I wrestle with that as a parent. I wrestle with that as a pastor. And I got to be honest, sometimes I will look and, and see what people in, in, in my churches in the past, you know, might have put on Facebook. And, and I go, oh, man, I, I must have blown it. I did a poor job of, of showing people the love of Christ and how he loves and how he views others. That's kind of natural. But what I have to keep reminding myself is that I'm not responsible for what someone else does. We have to have that own responsibility to ourselves. And that's the way we are. If we grew up in a cycle of dysfunction, we have to break that cycle of dysfunction. So Jesus says, no, it wasn't this man. It wasn't his parents. But God can still do something in his life. I love that. Because no matter what, how we grew up, no matter what influence was placed on us, God can still come and transform our lives. Now, what was interesting about the story is that Jesus healed him. People was, was confused, didn't understand why he could now see. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders interviewed him. They didn't like the fact that he was healed by Jesus. So they threw him out of the synagogue. And when they threw him out from the community of faith, can you believe it? When they threw him out, Jesus went to him. When Jesus heard about it, he came. And I love that because no matter what has happened in our past, Jesus Christ still comes to us. And he says, do you believe? And he can transform us. And that changes everything. See, when, when we transform our hearts are transformed. And when our hearts are transformed, it changes the way that we see ourselves. Bishop Kenneth Chamberlain used to say, he says this, he says, conversion is moving from that belongs to me to I belong to that. Did you catch the difference? Moving from that belongs to me to I belong to that. It, it's what what means is that, that our hearts are transformed, that we move from this selfish vision to a service vision, to move from do something for me to let me do and be for God and others. And that's one of the things that we wrestle with each and every moment, especially during this time, but all time, is are we willing to to do for God and do for others? Or are we just asking, what is God going to do for us? What's the church going to do for us? Asa did right in the eyes of the Lord because his eyes were always on the Lord. And that speaks volumes because we're able to do right in the eyes of God when we keep our eyes on our God. 
We do right in the eyes of the Lord when we keep our eyes on the Lord. So, so let me ask you this question this morning. Are you keeping your eyes on our God so he can come and, and mold us and change us and transform form us? Do, do we look beyond just what we want to see the needs of our community? See, can you see yourself? as one who is committed to be God's servant in this world. When our hearts transform, it changes the way we see ourselves, but it also changes the way that we see others. There's a story that I love is uh, one time told by the name, by the guy by the name of Tim Brester. And um, he tells about this mom who took her, her children to this crowded restaurant one day. And so they ordered their food, and this little six-year-old boy asked if he could say grace, and his mom says, sure. And uh, he says, God is great, and God is good. Let us thank him for the food. And God, I would thank you even more if mom would get us some ice cream for dessert. And liberty and justice for all. Amen. Well, of course, people started laughing, those who heard him, except for this one woman who was sitting kind of next to him. And, and she says, well, that's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray, asking God for ice cream. Why, I never. Well, of course, the little boy heard this and he broke out in tears and he says, Mom, did I do anything wrong? And, and Mom says, no, you did nothing wrong. Was God mad at me? No, God is not mad at you at all. So she hugged him. She kind of pulled him close. She reassured him that, that he was fine with his prayer. So they went ahead and ate. And, and of course, at the end, mom couldn't help but to buy him some ice cream. And so the ice cream came. It was placed around this, the table. And this little boy had his ice cream. And he looked at it. Then he got up and he took his bowl of ice cream and he he walked over, he, he put it down in front of this lady. And she kind of looked at him and was wondering what was going on. And all of a sudden he had this big smile on his face. And, and he says, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul. And my soul is good already. <laughs> but well, you can imagine, of course, the restaurant heard him and they started applauding. And, you know, I imagine that even Jesus was smiling a little bit because that little boy had already learned something that, that some of us are still learning. That how you look at others comes from a heart that has been changed, a heart that is transformed. When we're transformed and our lives are changed, we see with our hearts. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord because his life was transformed. And my prayer for us is that we will continue to let our God work within us, transforming our lives, transforming our hearts so we can transform, so that we can influence those around us. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray for us this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you that you are a God who is still in the business of changing lives. You, you take us no matter what our past is, and, and you're able to change us, to transform us through your Holy Spirit. And I know that some of us are dealing with, with cycles of brokenness that has been passed down from one generation to the next generation. Father, help us. Help us to break that cycle of, of, of brokenness. Help us to break that cycle of dysfunction. Change our minds. Change our hearts. Change our lives. And help us to live doing what is right in your eyes so that we may show people around us what it means to serve a God, to follow a God who can still change lives. Help us to influence others with your love, with your grace, with your holiness. For we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. for worshiping with us today and I hope that you will have a great week and remember do right in the eyes of the Lord by allowing our Christ to continue to transform us day in and day out keep loving God and keep loving each other now let's receive the benediction the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>